Uh, as I was uh, sitting over here getting ready to come up here, I realized this is the last message that I'm going to be preaching to you guys this year. Because next week we have the Christmas party, then the next two Wednesdays we're off because of Christmas and New Year's. And so the next time that I deliver a message to you guys, it will be 2020. So, yeah, some people, one person's excited. Hey, I'll be 20. <laughs> Corey says he'll be 20. So, it's a baby. So, I'm excited about that. And tonight, tonight I'm going to be bringing you a message that's a little bit different because we're, we're kind of taking um, a break. Or, or, I, I, a break's not the right word. We're going to focus on the Christmas season, all right? We're going to focus on the Christmas season. And so, while we're still in the Old Testament, we're going to be in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. Um, we're going to step back from our uh, continued progress through the Old and New Testament and uh, focus on a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles, open to the book of Isaiah. And as you open there, I want to start with a story. All right? And here's how this story goes. I need to look at my notes because I forgot. All right? All over the, the country and all over the world, news was brought. News was brought that was met with celebration because they were told that a baby was about to be born. And this baby would be the king. The rich and poor, the young and old, they all sent gifts to God. Or to, uh, not to God. They sent gifts to the baby that was to be born. There was so much anticipation, so much excitement. It was so crazy that, the, that it, it became known as um, royal baby fever. All right? Everybody was turned to it. Everybody was looking towards the coming of the king. Because a king brings hope. He brings anticipation. He brings the future. Now, this was not some ancient announcement of some royal king. This wasn't even the announcement of Jesus Christ coming. This was something that was real recent. It was the announcement of Prince William and his wife, Catherine, and their soon-to-be son, King George, back in 2013. But even today, even in our modern era, when we hear that royalty is being born, we pay attention. America was encapsulated with this. We were watching. We have nothing to do with that. They don't rule over us. They're, they're not a part of us in some, in some history a couple hundred years ago. But yet we were captivated with the birth of this king, looking forward to the hope and the anticipation of what would come in the future. And guys, that's how we should approach Christmas. Because Christmas reminds us that Jesus was born for us. And that he did something great. But here's the thing, and this is what I want us to focus on tonight. Christmas is just the beginning. Jesus was born, and that was very important. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried, and he was rose again. And that's really important. But that's not where the story ends. And a lot of times we stop at his death, burial, and resurrection. But what we need to do is we need to look forward to when this baby, who was born as a king, is going to return to reestablish 
his kingdom. If the Bible could be summed up in one line, it would be the king and his kingdom. And tonight we are going to look at that. We are going to be looking at a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. This passage in the book of Isaiah, it's chapter 11, comes at a time when Israel, as we have learned over the last few months, when Israel had, um, uh, uh, had rebelled against God, and God was coming down to punish them. And so, this prophecy was the hope that would come after that punishment had been dealt with. So this, this prophecy was there just to encourage them to give them uh, something to look forward to while they were facing the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. And so we'll start by reading in verse 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 as we go through. And then we will break this prophecy down verse by verse, looking at the promise of the king. Verse 11, chapter 1. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears, but he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with discipline from his mouth, and he will kill the wicked with commands from his lips. His righteousness will be a belt around his loins, and his faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling will all be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young ones will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like an ox, an infant will play beside the cobra pit, a toddler will place his hand into the snake den, nor will harm or None will harm or destroy the other on my holy mountain, for the land will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is full with water. And on that day, that the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for his people, the nations will seek him, and his resting place will be glorious. This is the promise of a king to come. But in, under, in order to understand it, we have to go back in order to get to the future. A prophecy is a message from God given through a prophet about something that's going to happen in the future. But a lot of times to understand prophecy, you have to go backwards and figure out where it's coming from and then where it's going. So to start, we need to understand what's said in verse 1. A shoot will grow out of the stump of Jesse. Well, who is Jesse? We don't know who he is. That's incorrect. Jesse is the, I almost said the son, is the father of King David. He is the father of King David. And King David was born as a shepherd. And during his birth, or during his childhood, he was called to be a king. Because you see, Israel, Israel had rejected God. And God and Israel uh, was originally ruled by God and the judges. But they demanded that God give them a king. And so God sent them Saul. But Saul failed. And he failed miserably. And so God removed the royal line from Saul and he gave it through Samuel to King David. And David became one of the most uh, important rulers of Israel. He grew and rose Israel in economic and military power, although he never knew peace. David was an important piece. Because it would be from his line that this king would come. They refer to the stump. 
when it talks about Jesse and a sprout that comes out of it, a branch that will bear fruit. And a lot of times they used a tree as a metaphor for the uh, city of Israel and how strong and profitable they were. And now he's saying that because they have rejected God, they will be cut down and all that will be left will be a remnant or a small stump. But that even though the stump looks dead, even though it looks sick, out of that stump comes hope, comes a little sprout. And out of that sprout, a new tree, a new kingdom can grow. And as David ended, uh, came near to the end of his life, he decided that he was going to build a temple for God and make this big and amazing, awesome uh, place of worship because God hadn't had a house in a long time. But God said, no, you will not build me a house. He said, I will build you a kingdom. And he told King David that his son would build a temple, but that one of King David's descendants would come and build a kingdom that would last eternally. When this king comes and establishes his kingdom, it will be one that will last forever. No one will stand against it, and it will be the greatest kingdom to ever be. And it is through his descendants that this will happen. And so then we have to look forward. You're going to find out. Then we have to look forward to Jesus. What's well, backwards for us, it's forward from David. And we get to Jesus. We get to this promised son of David. And just like David, Jesus was an unlikely king. You see, Israel was looking for a strong and powerful king. They were looking for a king like David. That's why I think, uh, and uh, so, several commentators that I found, that's why I think they referred to Jesse instead of David. Because Jesus was to be one like David and not one like Solomon, although he had a similar characteristic as we'll see in a minute. And so I believe that they used Jesse, that Isaiah used Jesse in order to, to show that this descendant would be one like David. And so Jesus was born. But he wasn't born in a palace like everyone expected. He wasn't born to a king. No, he was born in a stable with a bunch of animals. He was born to a carpenter and to a young virgin woman. He wasn't what they expected. He wasn't who they were looking for. But he tore down all expectations of what it meant to be a king. Because Jesus stepped down from the stone and became a servant for us. He was born to live the life that you and I live, to face the same temptations that you and I face, to face the same evil that you and I see every day. He lived a perfect life. And that's what Christmas is to remind us about, that birth, that perfect life. And then it's to point us forward to Easter when Christ died for us and he rose again. But a lot of times, that is where we stop the story. We stop the story there. We go, Jesus was born. He died. He was buried and he rose again. That's amazing. I need to trust him. I need to love him. But what we need to remember is that we need to look forward to the future, to his second coming, because God and Isaiah here, they prophesy about a king, a king of justice, a king of of peace. He is the future hope that we have to look forward to. And we need to look forward to his coming. So who is this king? Well, Isaiah gives us a great example of who he is. Right? He starts off by showing us that this king is a king of justice. 
Verse 2 tells us that the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him and he will be filled with wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and a fear of the Lord. It reminds us that Jesus is going to be a wise judge. That he's going to have all of these uh, attributes at his disposal. Often when we think about wisdom and knowledge, we think about King Solomon, David's son, who when God came to him and said, uh, we need, you can have anything you want, you just name it. And instead of gold or power um, or influence, Solomon said, I would like wisdom. And he became the wisest person on the earth until Jesus was born. Jesus will be like Solomon's with his wisdom. But the difference is, Jesus won't give in to the earthly temptations. Jesus did not give in to those earthly temptations. And he will have the knowledge and the fear of the Lord to judge us properly. And what I love about Jesus is this. It says he will not judge based on what his eyes see. He will not judge based on what his ears hear. You see, Jesus doesn't come and he doesn't look at the outside. He doesn't look at, at how uh, popular we are, at how great our grades are. At, he doesn't look at how great we are at sports. He doesn't look at our appearance. He doesn't care if you're young or old. He doesn't care if you're rich or poor. He doesn't care if you've got holes in your knees or you've got brand new pants. Jesus looks at the heart. He looks deep down, and he tries, he doesn't try, he sees the trueness of our heart. Is your heart dark and black, filled with sin and evil? Or is your heart bright and shining because you've put your faith in God, you've repented of your sins, and he has cleansed your heart? It doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from, what you've done, or where you've been. If you trust in him and you ask him to come into your life, he will change your heart and he will look at you when he comes to establish his kingdom and he will know whether you've trusted him or whether you have trusted in yourself. And here's the thing about those who choose to trust in themselves. It says this in verse 4. He, uh, uh, verse four. Uh, he will strike the land with discipline from his mouth, and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. That lets us know one thing. Exodus 2. Justice will come swiftly for those who do not trust him. So swiftly, he won't even have to raise a hand to enact justice. It'll be a command from his mouth or words from his lips. He will look into your heart and he will know and cast judgment upon you with nothing but his words. And that justice will come swiftly and it will be permanent when his kingdom is established. But we must remember, his righteousness will be a belt about his loins. And his faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. And I find this imagery so important because a belt is what holds things together. It's what protects the vitals. It covers the stomach and protects them from anything that could penetrate or hurt the stomach or hurt those vital organs. And it holds everything together. It's vitally important. And so when we see that, we can look and see that at Jesus' very core, the things he holds most dear, the things that hold us all together are his righteousness and his faith. And while he may judge the wicked, there is hope. And for those of us that believe in him, that have put our faith in him, the king will bring peace. When we look at our world, it is broken. It is damaged. 
I mean, you can go online, and, or not online, you can go at home and you can turn on uh, the Animal Planet or National Geographic, and at almost any time of the day, when you turn on one of those, one of those channels, right, you'll turn it on, and it'll be like, in the African savannah, we follow the lion as he stalks his prey. And you see this lion just kind of hanging out there, slowly creeping towards an antelope or a goat or something to eat, and it's creeping and it's creeping, and finally it shoots off after it, right? And it charges. And with any luck, it will succeed. Or with any luck, its prey will escape. But that's the way our world is. It's predator versus prey. Even in our city world, even as humans, yeah, we're not running around trying to kill each other for food, but people lie, steal, cheat to try to gain an advantage, to try to climb up the next run. This world is survival of the fittest. But when Jesus comes, when he comes to see us, that will change. There will be a peace. There will be a bonding. I mean, I love what they say here, all right? And I don't know if you caught all this. The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the goat, they will lie down next to each other. You'll never see that in today's world. The calf and the young lion and the fatling will all be together. A child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze with their young, and their young will lie down together. A lion will eat straw like an ox. But then what I find most shocking is an infant will play beside the cobra. A toddler will reach his hand into the snake den. But then it says something amazing. No harm will come. And neither will destroy the other. The animals will hang out together. Children of poisonous snakes will be right next to each other. It seems unfathomable. It seems crazy. But that is the kingdom that God promises. And here's what I love about it. It takes us back in order to get to the future. Because when we see this imagery of these snakes here, we can't help but be drawn back to Genesis 3. When a serpent entered the garden, it brought temptation. And man and woman for the first time listened to someone other than God and chose to sin against God. And they brought this destruction, this evil, this sin into the world. But when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom, there will be no fear. There will be no danger. But there will be comfort and there will be true peace. We will no longer be fighting with each other, trying to hurt each other, or destroying one another. But when Jesus comes, he will stand as a banner, a rallying point for all to, to call to him and desire him and his resting place will be glorious. When I say back to the future, when Jesus comes, he's going to take us back to his creation. Because God created the earth to be good. And he said it was very good. And when Jesus comes as king, he's going to restore his kingdom. He's going to take us back to the way it was meant to be in creation. That perfect world of heaven and earth together, fellowship with God, all has been forgiven. And so over the next few weeks, as we hang out and enjoy Christmas, we need to look at Christ's birth. As the beginning, enjoy it. Focus on it. Thank him for coming. Let it point us to Easter, to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But don't stop there. Look forward to his second coming. 
to the return of our King, who will come and conquer this earth. He will judge the wicked. But most of all, He will bring about peace. He will bring perfection. He's going to take creation back to the way He intended it to be. And while we're waiting, we need to share this news. We need to tell others that there is a king who rules over this world, who created this world, who spoke it into existence. And when he saw our wickedness, when he saw our rejection, he didn't turn up his nose and stay in his throne room. He humbled himself. He came down to this earth to live for us. He left his throne room for a manger. He lived a perfect life. He died an innocent man, an innocent king, an innocent God. And then he rose again to save us. He didn't abandon us. He didn't go away. He came to save us. And the story is still continuing. Because he's coming again. He's coming again to take us back to the future. To make us whole again. So the question for tonight is this. Will you trust him and be saved? Or will you trust in yourself and be judged? Because he doesn't look at the outside. He only looks at the inside. And he can see whether you're evil or <coughs> wicked or whether you're repented and restored. So will you trust in the king and wait for his coming kingdom? Let's bow our heads. Tonight there may be some of you